Welcome aboard Flight 1969, service to Jet Nation Radio. Look at what a leader this guy is. Both is fighting for his job this year. This is what quarterbacks are made of. Doug Middleton, re- get a 50-yard onside kick. How stupid can you possibly be making that much money? Folks, grab a snack. Let's go to eat a goddamn snack. And join Joe Blewett and Glenn Naughton for Jet Nation Radio. <laughs> New York Jets fans, thank you for joining us tonight. I am Glenn Naughton. Joe Blewett will not be on tonight, as many of you know, uh, throughout most of the offseason. Joe's going to be preoccupied with the police academy, and it'll be me uh, either flying solo or with one of the uh, many friends of the show that we have. Tonight it will be Kyle Smith calling in and joining us in a little bit. Um, Joe and I will be trying to squeeze in some weekend shows from time to time and see how that goes. Uh, we got one in last week, and that's one way to, to navigate around it. We did have some technical difficulties a little while ago. Kyle and I did have, well, I did about 10, 12 minutes, and Kyle joined me, and we had to start over. So um, I will not repeat everything I said, but um, Kyle is with us now. Thanks again for calling in, Kyle. Thank you for having me on, Glenn. Appreciate it. Um, anytime, anytime. So basically, uh, what I said earlier, Kyle, I will do a, a much shorter version because, again, this has been beaten to death. Um, you can't do a Jet show and not talk about Kirk Cousins right now. Um, as I said to you earlier, he is his. You know, wherever he lands is going to be the biggest factor in how the Jets' off season unfolds. He's it's, he's rumored to be you know down to choosing between the Jets and Vikings. Kyle, um, Kyle and I have both said uh, for quite some time the Jets have a good shot. I'm a little less optimistic than I was a couple of months ago because you know the the and even, this is even before the heavy Minnesota rumors started. I just he just strikes me as a guy small town uh, probably wants his family to you know be raised in a small town with a different environment than you'll get in New York City. And that's as I've said in past shows, it's not like you can't bring him up to uh, Chappaqua or Scarsdale and show him a nice uh, nice quiet life. But um, but either way, um, we don't know where Kirk Cousins is going to land, if he does land with the Jets. And, and, Kyle, I don't know if you saw this tweet I sent out the other day. It's not, nothing earth-shattering, but I think I've seen others sort of along these lines. But he, here's how I view the offseason right now or the quarterback position for Mike McCagnin. Um He's got a lot of options, but only one of those options can get him fired at the end of this season. Um, option number one, sign Kirk Cousins. Option number two, you miss out on Kirk Cousins. You trade up into the top three or four and draft a quarterback. That buys you a couple more years. Option number three, you stand pat at six. You roll the dice. You hope that maybe the Colts and Giants take a Barkley and a Chubb or something along those lines, and then maybe a Josh Rosen falls to you at six, and you get your guy there. And even if it's not whoever it is, Baker Mayfield, Josh Rosen, whoever, you get someone at six. Um, and the last option, of course, is if he doesn't get Cousins and doesn't get a good veteran, and doesn't get somebody at the top of the first round, unless he takes somebody in round two or three or four or whatever that outplays one of those first-round guys, I think he can be out of the job. What do you think of that, Kyle? Oh, yeah, I did see that tweet, and I liked it, and I agreed with it. Yeah, I mean, listen, a lot of people are saying, oh, there's top four quarterbacks. I really just consider it to be three. I hate Josh Allen. I'm pretty sure you do, too. I remember you saying a couple weeks ago when a caller called in that, there's no way the Jets can draft Hackenberg again because, or excuse me, Allen again because he's just like Hackenberg in the sense that he's very inaccurate. Um, but listen, I mean, could Allen go in the top five? Most certainly. I mean, we all knew this would happen. You know, the Shorts Warrior, you know, people evaluate, oh, he's throwing 70 yards in the air and look at the rifle he had, 62 miles an hour velocity at the combine. Like, people are going nuts. So I could see him going in the top five. But all that means is that there's got to be a good chance that there's going to be one of those top four quarterbacks at six. And you can't miss. You can't miss on taking one there. And, yes, the Jets do have assets, being that they have that extra second-round pick, to trade up this year. So if, if Mike McCagnin somehow doesn't walk away with a future franchise quarterback this offseason, I do believe he should be fired. So and now, I'm in agreement with you. And, yeah, and, and, and like I said, that's, that's the one scenario that won't be acceptable. As far as me with Josh Allen, it's not that I don't like him. Um, I, I don't love him. I'm kind of on the fence. I, 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 I think people are making too much of the talent around him, but 
I also do feel like it wasn't very good. I think I saw a number the other day. Um, I forget which game it was. It was a game that people were pointing out as one of his worst games of the year, and some analyst came out and said he was he was. Uh, they, they did, you know, they looked at the snap counts and they broke down the film, and they said he was uh, he was under heavy pressure on 41 percent of the snaps, like he was literally just running away from people the whole time. But either way, my, the point I made, and and I stand by it, whether or not whatever his ceiling may be and whatever they may think he's going to be, Mike McCagney can't afford to risk another pick on a on a even though you know Hack's a little different because he was a second rounder, but you still can't roll the dice on another guy. Who struggles with accuracy? It's got to be if it's not if it's not Rosen or Donald if they're not there. I think you got to go with Mayfield. You got to be able to look your owner in the face and say, "Listen, Mr. Johnson, this this guy completed you know 68 percent of his passes, and based on the number of drops he had, he was on target 78 percent of the time or whatever it was. You know that we thought this guy would would trans you know would would uh, would, would develop well as a pro, whether it happens or not." But to sit there and go, yeah, we rolled the dice on another guy who completes his passes in the 50s, and lo and behold, he's still in the 50s. Um, that it's really indefensible to do that twice. Um, and I also, and I don't know what you think about this, Kyle, but when I look at Josh Allen, and I think a lot of GMs do this, um, well, not a lot, but I think some GMs, but I think we saw it a little bit already once with John Elway, with Paxton Lynch. I think when former players or GMs, they lean toward guys that remind them of themselves. And I would imagine John Elway is looking at Josh Allen and going, oh, I used to throw the ball 70 yards from my knees too. And I was big, and I was mobile, and I was a little bit inaccurate, but I, I, I straightened that out. We can fix this guy. That's why I think Josh Allen is the guy that Denver's going to go after if they don't sign Keenum or, or Cousins, which is, you know, that possibility has been floated around. I, yeah, I hope you're right, and I do agree with you. I mean, it makes perfect sense, right? I mean, like, listen, Elway, Hall of Fame career, two Super Bowls, you know, played in several others, you know, he's like, hey, listen, I know that this type of skill set can be successful, and this is a, a once-in-a-generation type of skill set. You know, Mayock saying, oh, this is, he's got the most talented arm that I've seen since Jamarcus Russell, and that may be true, but, you know, Allen is also more athletic than Russell was. Russell, you know, oh, oh God, yeah, fat bum. You know, even, like, even though, like, Russell would have, like, a couple, like, athletic scramble plays here or there in college, but Allen is, you know, He's much more, like, committed to the game. I think you can clearly see that than Russell ever oh, was. Oh, God, yeah. So he does have these in- intangibles and stuff. It's just I, I, the way I look at it is, you know, it's really hard to be a successful quarterback when you're, you're constantly – you're dropping your shoulders once pressure comes. And I know he's under pressure a lot, and, you know, that makes – you start seeing things that you wouldn't otherwise saw once you're under that much pressure all the time. But um, he, he just doesn't throw with any anticipation and stuff. And those are the types of skill sets that you – that you need to be a successful quarterback in the NFL. We take these types of guys all the time that have big time arm. I mean, think of Logan Thomas a couple of years ago, look at his spider graph, mockdraftable.com, you know, even as like, and he's playing tight end right now for the bills. He went in like the third round or whatever, Arizona drafted him. Like, you know, Bruce Arians is known for that downfield type of thrones system. But, you know, Mark Schofield put out a great article today about velocity and stuff and arm strength. And the article was basically saying, like, you know, most teams, if you look at the averages, and he put up a whole slew of data, 90% of throws across the league are between 1 and 20 yards. So, yes, Allen does have a cannon. He can push the ball that far. But how often do you really need to do that? What's much more important is you clicking through progressions, you showing poise, you throwing with anticipation. All these things matter so much more than what kind of a rifle you have of an arm. So, yeah, I saw a number a few years ago. As much as we talk about, uh, as much as everyone talks about Aaron Rodgers being, you know, the greatest quarterback, you know, f- physically, um, you know, and, and and all the the hail marys and the big throws, I saw a stat on him a few years ago that something like seventy percent of his throws were inside of ten yards. Like he will just pick you apart and wait for the big play to open up, and then he'll beat you deep. But uh, it, it's a good point. You know, you look at passes that that travel, you know, completions that travel over fifty yards in the air. How many of those is a great quarterback? The best quarterbacks in the league. How many of those do they have in a year? Three? You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, it's nice to be able to do that, to, to have that element in your passing game, just to be able to back defenses off a little bit because they have to respect it. But let's not pretend that if you have a big arm, you're just going to come out and heave the ball down the field and, and pick people apart. So um, it's a nice thing to have. But, yeah, so, so that's where I am. I don't, I don't, I'm, I'm very much on the fence with him. I can't say I don't like him. 
because I, I can see there's enough there that he could be great. He does have that high ceiling. But I don't feel like the Jets are in a position to take another gamble on a guy with a, with a low completion percentage. They're just, they, they don't have that luxury right now. But, uh, but speaking of free agency, um, big name uh, added to the list this week that not a lot of people anticipated. Jacksonville Jaguars decided not to franchise tag Allen Robinson. Here's a guy who in three years in the league has been one of the most productive. Had, you know, I think I saw only four or five other receivers in league history. Um, match his total in yards, touchdowns, basically production over his first three years before he was injured last year. Um, how hard should the Jets go after this guy? I wouldn't go after him too hard. And part of that is my philosophy. I don't really believe in giving big-time contracts to free agent wide receivers. When has that model ever really worked for teams? Oh, we signed the big splash free agent wide receiver. You know, I think back to Mike Wallace signing with the Dolphins a couple of years back. Um, it, it really doesn't ever bear fruit. I mean, look at the Patriots. The Patriots, one of their biggest signings a couple of years ago was Chris Hogan. Chris Hogan's getting $4 million a year. They signed him in three years, $12 million. You know, I mean, you don't need to go out and sp- get a big-time wide receiver, I, I don't think. Um, and all the more reason, he's coming off a torn ACL. And, you know, a lot of people nowadays with how advanced surgeries are, they do respond well. But you never know for sure. So you're going to go out and give this guy a huge contract, and you, there is that big question mark. I know he's young, and that's all the more reason for him to respond well, but you don't really know. That doesn't mean that I wouldn't make a push for him, but I wouldn't get I, I think, I, think I would guy. offer him good money, but over two years. Because um, okay. I would and want that fair. guy, especially, especially if you're going to have a young quarterback coming in, you're going to want those targets. Um, and he's a guy that, you know, he does a great job of going and getting the ball. And uh, I, I wouldn't – obviously, a guy coming off that series of an injury, I wouldn't give him big money over big years. But I'd, I'd pay him well for a two-year span. And let's, let's face it, even if he has a huge first year, you, you give him an extension say, all right, this guy's back. Um, he's not quite in the same class as Cousins, but he is. And that's why I say it was surprising that he hit free, uh, free agency. There were – I saw a lot of, a lot of uh, prognosticators and, and, uh, and insiders that said they were really surprised. He didn't get the tag, and then Jacksonville tried to work something something out with him long term, because you don't often see guys that young and that talented hitting free agency. Um, as I've said with Cousins, we've never seen this before. Um, I can't in my lifetime I can't think of a 29 year old healthy quarterback with a resume like his to hit free agency. Um, but Robinson again, not as big a deal as he's not a quarterback, but just his youth, his production. Um, I think they should go hard after him, but not for a long-term deal because you don't know if he'll bounce back. If he does, I like the idea of being able to negotiate him without, while he's under contract. Yeah, and I'm, I'm all for that, Glenn. And, you know, especially in this year where the Jets have to spend money. And the Jets, the reality is, is they don't have many big-time contracts on the horizon. Yeah, you've got Leonard Williams coming course, up in a exactly. couple of years. But, out, but outside of that, what do you really have? Nothing. So, yeah, you can, you can offer over a short period. That's fine. But don't get into a bidding war and give this guy a five-year deal, $40-plus million guarantee. That's, that's a contract to me which you'll never see your, your value on. But, I mean, Robinson as a player, if he can get back to what he was and potentially even get better than that, that's, that's great talent right there. You know, Christian Hackenberg, I'm one of those people that said, you know, even his freshman year, that, that narrative is a sham, that Hackenberg had a great freshman year. No, he didn't. That's such bullshit. Um, if, but one thing that stood out when I was watching Hackenberg's tape and going through it with a fine-tooth comb is Allen Robinson bailed him out all the time. Hackenberg would make these incredibly inaccurate throws, but Allen Robinson would basically climb a ladder, go up and get the ball. And he did the same thing his first couple of years in the league with another terribly inaccurate quarterback, Blake Bortles. But ironically, both of those guys were coached up by um, uh, Jordan Palmer. Um, so he's got a thing for coaching these inaccurate quarterbacks. Uh, it sure seems but, like it, and that, and that's that's I think that's sort of another tick in Robinson's favor is that here's a guy that you know playing with with Blake Bortles, um, you know scored 22 touchdowns in three years, um, in in 40 starts he only started eight games his rookie year, so um, super productive with with a with a bad quarterback in college and in the pros. So we'll see what happens there. I mean, you know, there's no way the Jets cannot make a run at a player like this, but uh, how far they're willing to go remains to be seen. Um, and, and staying on the uh, on the, the pass catcher end of things, 
I want to. I was curious to get your opinion here because this is something that we talked about during the season, and I think you, you, you and Joe and myself, we were all in agreement um, with the Austin Safari and Jenkins thing at that at that time. That he, we kind of felt like he would get six, seven million a year. We're now seeing reports he wants seven million a year. I don't remember exactly when we had that conversation, but I know that he didn't catch a touchdown over the last seven or eight games. He averaged two or three catches a game, averaged seven yards of reception on the year. Um, I've kind of cooled on Austin Safarian Jenkins because when you, when you look at his season as a whole, you know, a couple touchdowns and 350 yards, I think you can get that out of just about any jag tight end. Um, I, to me, those are easily replaceable numbers. And I know the Jets have money. They shouldn't hesitate to spend. That's why they've got it. But I also don't think they should be throwing it away on a guy whose production is sort of in line with a guy who makes two, three million a year, and he wants seven because he had four or five good weeks. Yeah, I mean, you got to go above and beyond the numbers. I mean, Jeff Cumberland probably put up similar numbers, if not better. But a lot of Cumberland's mm-hmm. numbers always came in garbage time. You know, where he's catching, he's catching a slant over the middle where the defense is in prevent because they have a, a three touchdown lead, and then he's just breaking a tackle here or there. You know, but um, you know, Safarian Jenkins. You know, if you look at some of his catches, he showed a lot of skills that really are something, you know, that you admire. You know, he goes up there, uses his body, sheds off uh, physical defenders like Patrick Chung. He does stuff. a good job of shielding you know, defenders. He does. Yeah, he uses his arms. I mean, he's got those long arms. He's got that big frame, goes up and gets the ball. I mean, he was doing a lot of that. And a lot of it was, you know, the Jets, they didn't, they didn't use him up the scene. Despite the fact that he did improve his speed, he did, you know, he did become a little bit more nimble. I mean, his first year with the Jets – that dude couldn't move for his life. Um, so part of it was and, misuse. And you, Go ahead. No, sorry. It's funny you say that because that is my one caveat. Every time I say I've kind of cooled on him, and I, I, I said it to Joe, I feel like I said it every two or three weeks, weeks during the season. And I just kept saying, exactly. I, I kept saying, when are we going to see him run up the scene for a 30- or 40-yard gain? Why are we just seeing him, every ball they're throwing him is inside of 10 yards or in the red zone? And I know he's not, you know, he's not a speedster, but he's got enough skills that he can create some mismatches. And, of course, you have to, you know, the two, the two big factors, I think, um, with him and that, that contributed to his decrease in production. One, he went from Josh McCown to Bryce Petty over the last four or five weeks of the season. And two, if you look at his snap count, that was, by, I mean, I know he's not a rookie, but he's never played that many, nearly that many reps in an NFL season. So I wonder if he got a little tired down the stretch and Bryce Petty, so it's not the, and and I also don't like the fact that he's one dimensional. I I like a two dimensional guy, um, and I wouldn't hate having him back. I just when I look at how he fell off the face of the earth, and you know he had a couple big drop touchdowns against Carolina, um, so he was he was an improvement. But I just feel like like when I said he was worth seven million, I didn't anticipate him averaging two catches a game for the last five six weeks of the season. Um, so that scares me a little. So. I'm not at a point where I hate the idea of having him back. I just feel like if the Jets went more than five, you know, I mean, five, five and a half, I mean, it really, I guess it's silly if you, with the money they have if you're saying the difference between five and a half and seven. But I look at a, a, a you know, again, I feel like a lot, of, a lot of guys could probably do what he did last year. And, and I said it several times. Is he not capable of making big plays, or was it just the way John Morton was calling the plays and not putting him in position to do that? Well, Glenn, it's, it's easy for us to say a lot of guys could do what he did, but the fact is is we haven't had a guy that could do what he did in years. We haven't. So, I mean, we could say that all we want, but we just haven't had that guy. And when you well, look well, that's at the, the thing, tight end contract, too, we, I, I think, you know, and, and I'm not going to do the revisionist history thing. I, I didn't have a problem with it at the time, so I'm not going to complain about it now. But, I mean, the other reality is that, I think, uh, you know, he, he, you mentioned Jeff Cumberland earlier. You know, he's far from an all-world tight end, but he, he's a hell of a lot better than, you know, he, he deserved more than seven targets in an entire season under Chan Gailey. They just basically made the guy invisible. Um, so I, I don't think I – mean, I, I see what you're saying, but I think the lack of production the Jets had was more game planning than talent. And I'm, I'm not saying they were great, but let's face it, no tight end in the NFL is so bad that he should play a full season as a starter – and come away with, like, four receptions um, as, as your receiving tight end. As your blocker, yeah, fine, you live with that. But um, 
Yeah, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, but that was uh, just a thought that popped in my head. Hey, yeah, and that's that's a fair criticism, and I know you're not even equating Cumberland's skill set to Safarian Jenkins, but I'm going to do that for a moment. They're not comparable. You could never go up and throw a fade route in the red zone to Jeff Cumberland. He didn't no. have that ability to go up and get it. You know, he didn't have the ability to go up and, and you know, hands catch a ball right over the middle. You know, he didn't have the ability to line up uh, as a receiver on the outside and shrug off a defensive back and, and catch a ball on a No, he just, didn't, he just didn't have the size for that. No, not at all. And so, like, yeah. but when you look at tight end contracts, and I know you're a big fan of overthecap.com, pull them up. There's, I mean, look at the amount of tight ends that are getting around seven million dollars a year. You look at some of those guys. And oh yeah, like, and that, that okay. was yeah, we we did that when when you and I and Joe had this conversation, and it, and and you're right, and that was my point at the time. But part of it too is that I started looking at the bottom of the list, and I'm seeing guys making one point five two million a year, um, and and again, as you said, and I and we say it all the time, it's not just about the numbers, and that's why I mentioned the you know the possible fatigue factor, the change in quarterbacks. Um, I just. I I guess I I guess my expectation from from his camp was that it, they kind of have to understand the fact he disappeared late in the year, um, and that you know that's not going to get you a huge payday, and and it is it, I probably am splitting hairs at this point, but I, I didn't like the uh, a drop in production I can live with. It was the complete disappearing, like you've gone from being a, a central part of the offense, and but there is that part of me that says. What if this guy goes somewhere else and he gets a, he he plays for an offensive coordinator and says, you know what, we're just going to run this guy at the team all day and let him make plays down the field? Because we saw that in camp. That was something Joe and I commented on a few times. Austin Terry and Jenkins was a superstar in camp, and it was they were throwing them the ball down the field. And then the season started, yeah. and that just completely came to an end. You know, I think your point about Bryce Petty was an excellent one. I mean, think about it. In any in any offense. How often is the tight end the first read? You know, in many concepts, Mm -hmm. how many times is the tight end the first read? Now, McCown can go through progressions and click from first, second, to third, to check down. Mm -hmm. He's very good. I mean, he's pretty good at that if you compare him to the average NFL quarterback. Bryce Petty is a one-read quarterback. Three years in the league, he's still that guy. So, Throwing the first guy. I don't think uh, that never really came into Bryce Petty's thinking process. So I think that's a big reason. I think your other point about snap count was also a big part. So I mean, I do believe that if McCown, yeah, he we, be, was still a because of all the trouble he had in Tampa. You know, he never played more than a few hundred snaps, and then he plays his first full season. Like I said, it's not it's not technically a rookie wall. It's not a rookie wall, but hell, it's a this is the first time in my life my body has had to endure this wall, whatever you want to call it. Um, so we'll see what happens there, but uh, you know it's it, it's going to be interesting. You know, getting back on the uh, the free agency thing, I think there were uh, some people that were uh, Kyle Fuller gets hit with a transition tag. Um, wanted to bring him up too, and we I, I got off on a a tangent on pass catchers, but Kyle Fuller, which, to me, he should be the, the the at the top of the Jets list in terms of corners. Um, I feel like he can do what what Todd Bowles would, is going to ask his corners to do. Um, they Bears him with a transition tag, which means if the Jets make an offer, there's no compensation if the Bears can't match. The Bears just basically have the opportunity to match any offer a team makes. And uh, just wondering for you, your thoughts on that is it, where where would he be on your list of free agents, and is he a guy you would want to go after? You know. I can't say that I've watched a lot of Fuller over the years. He's an NFC guy. Naturally, I watch more AFC. Um, what I, the, the little bit that I have watched of him in his career, I've, I've liked. And I started laughing when you brought him up because he picked your boy, Geno Smith, off in the end zone on um, Monday Night I was Football. at that game. I was at that game. Everybody picked Geno yeah. Smith off that night. <laughs> and but, uh, that, it was, that a, really, game, it was that, a really that, nice interception that game, from what I remember. That game to me. Anytime anyone tells you, if you ever run into these lunatics who tell you Geno Smith was a bad quarterback because he, he didn't have an opportunity to succeed, point them to that game and watch that. Watch that game on the All 22. The Jets got in the red zone, I think, seven times that night. There had to be at least four or five plays where he's got receivers running around wide open. In some cases, waving their arms in the back of the end zone, and he's just holding onto the ball and holding onto the ball taking a sack, kicking a field goal. Um, he had one play where Jeremy Curley was in the back right corner, back left corner of the end zone, waving his arms, 
and he throws to Greg Salas, who's double covered, and it's batted away. I mean, and I'm watching that game, and I'm like, so none of this is his fault, right? This is because his receivers suck, but they're all running around with no defenders. So, sorry, sorry to get Geno sidetracked, but uh, you, you mentioned that game, and to me that, that's the game I always point to and say, don't tell me this guy didn't have weapons. I don't care what the, the name on the back of the guy's jersey is. If you got dudes running around the end zone wide open and you're not seeing them and you're not hitting them, that is, that's not the weapon's fault. You know, but, uh, but yeah, Fuller, uh, I, I, from what I've seen of him, I've really liked him. I liked him coming out of college, and he, to me he would be the top guy. I know I saw a rumor the other day, Brashad Breland is the guy the Jets are going to target. Um, and he, 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 here's what, a question for you. Stick, again. Can we stick with Fuller for a moment? Um, oh, yeah, sorry. Go ahead, Kyle. I know that um, Ian Wharton, who if you're, if you're looking for an evaluation of cornerback play, there's no one that you go to, and I'm talking about NFL cornerback play, uh, before Ian Wharton, NFL film study on Twitter. Um, he's actually releasing, I don't think he's released it yet, a cornerback handbook. And he's been tweeting out a couple images of, you know, pages of players. You know, like he, he's charted every defensive back in the league, or at least all the starters, you know, their success rate, you know, in off man versus press man. And I, I can't remember exactly what he said about four. I'm trying to pull it up on my phone right now. But I know he was saying he was a star this year. And I do also know that his brother, Kendall, who was just traded to the Chiefs, he was his mm-hmm. number one graded slot uh, corner in the league. Uh, so right. Fuller's really good. I mean, Fuller's re- based on what I've seen, he's very good. Ian's saying he's a, he was a star this year. The concern with Fuller is um, injuries. You know, that, that was his big uh, thing that was holding him back the past couple of years. So that's a concern. But the kid can play for sure. And I'll say one thing, too. It's going to be a little difficult for us to evaluate him if we do sign him and we want to go back and watch some film. Because if you ever put on a Bears All-22 tape, they have the worst All-22 tape in the league. It's so close up that you can't really see the field develop like that. And you really need that to evaluate how a corner plays, like, you know, when he goes through the entire route. So right. just a little nugget on that. But uh, I, 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 would, yeah. I would, right now I'd endorse us pushing some money forth to him because we, you can never, ever have too many cornerbacks in the NFL. You know, just think about Denver a couple of years ago. You know, they had Tlaib was at the top of his game and they had, uh, oh God, uh, Chris Harris Jr., Top of his game, yep. talk about Pro Bowl ish type of corners. That didn't stop them from taking a corner in the first round. And Bradley yep. Roby, you know, Bradley I mean, Roby, Ohio State, yeah. So yeah, and so you know the. Go ahead. No, go go ahead. Go go ahead and finish up your thought. I had a a question about uh, the 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 whole the spending thing is a general question, um, based on a couple of things I've read. But go ahead and finish up. Let's see. Uh, um. So, yeah, I mean, I was just saying, like, I, I don't mind putting – cornerback is one of those positions I would definitely put money into. And this is the year for the Jets to spend. And I did pull up the tweet about uh, Kyle Fuller and Ian Wharton's uh, coverage productivity. He said the only um, – there is a slew of press-centric free agents and only one elite off-man corner, and that's Kyle Fuller, and he'll be quite the catch if he hits the open market. Now think about that for a moment. You know, let's say the Jets re-sign Morris Claiborne. Mo Claiborne's the best, at his best, when he's in press, right up in the receiver's face, when he can get those long mm-hmm. arms on him from the jump. But the interesting thing is, Bowles played him off a lot this year. And we were like, what the hell? That's not where his strength is. And he did the same thing with Revis a lot the previous year. And that wasn't Revis' strength, mm-hmm. either, obviously. Um, now, for whatever reason, if Bowles wants to do some off-man Fuller could be the guy to do it, and then on the opposite side of the field, you can use Claiborne right up in the receiver's face. So I think that's kind of a nice little balance between corners there. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, that's the thing is you get two different guys who excel in a couple different areas, and and as Joe and I said uh, a couple times, if I'm not mistaken, during the season, I wondered if, um, because you're right, that you know we saw with Revis playing off, a lot more than you'd expect with Mo Claiborne playing off. And I wondered if it was just Todd Bowles realizing he didn't have anybody to get to the quarterback and he was trying not to get beat deep because it was it was frustrating as a fan, especially the Revis thing, especially that, you know, that that was that to me was like the first moment where I, I, I wondered if Todd Bowles had lost his mind 
was that Week 17 Buffalo game where he uh, he had Darrell Rivas lining up 10, 12 yards off of Sammy Watkins all day, and the Bills just kept hitting him. I think Sammy had like 12 catches that day. They just kept hitting him on yeah. on comebacks and and you know and hooks, and there was nothing the Jets could do. Nothing the Jets could do about it. They weren't dropping another defender between Rivas and uh, and Watkins, and they were just getting eaten alive. Um, and I I know that's probably because if you look at the previous matchups, even though Sammy Watkins didn't put up any big plays in the box score, it was because he was getting overthrown. When Rebus was trying to press him, Sammy Watkins was taking him to school. And I think the Jets saw that on film and said, we got to play off, we can't cover here. And I think whenever Todd Bowles realizes that they can't cover or worries about not being able to get to the quarterback and feeling like his quarterback can't cover forever, he backs guys off. And I think Fuller can do both if uh, if asked, and it'll give him, a, you know, Another another guy on his defense who can do a couple different things. So, to me, he's my my top guy. I was worried he was going to get franchised. He didn't. He got hit with the transition tag. So we'll we'll see how that plays out. And uh, one thing I wanted to talk to you about uh, not not so much um, th- this isn't so much a Jets topic. It could be if he's if he's taken by the Jets. But two two semi controversial issues going on at the moment. Um, I don't know if you heard about the. Uh, the Darius Guy story at the combine. Did you hear about that? No, not at all. What happened? Um, another sort of reminiscent of the the Des Bryant situation with Jeff Ireland and the Dolphins. Um, they didn't reveal which team, but oh, apparently I know what a you're team. Talking about now. Some team asked uh, yeah, Darius Guys if he's gay. That's weird. Uh, what's the point of that? What, what do you think is the team's logic behind asking that question? Well, the, here's here's my theory, is that um, a couple different theories. Um, one, and I think I heard this after the Des Bryant one, so it's, that's probably why this is a theory with the, one of the two, um, that teams want to, they want to ask you, they want to try to get under your skin a little bit and see if you jump out of your chair and try to joke somebody and see if you can keep your cool um, in a in a, a setting where you're you're supposed to be calm. You know, what's your, what's your temper like? Can you keep your composure under under high stress. Um, that was one thing that I heard. Um, that was with the Des Bryant thing. Uh, one thing I, that a thought that I had is we hear all the time how these, these NFL teams, they do all this in-depth research on these players. They send, you know, whether it's NFL security or team security to, to campuses and schools and bars these guys go to and, and ask around about them. Now, Maybe you, if you're working for, you know, Team X and they like Darius Geis and they come back and say, you know, we uh, a couple people that know him said that he's, he's made some, uh, you know, some homophobic. And I'm saying I'm not saying he has done this, but if mm. if they have information that there may be an issue with him, you know, if he's had incidents in the past where people are like, oh, we, we think he may not get along with gay people. He may have a problem with gay people. And then you say, well, we don't want a guy like that in our organization. Well, what's the best way to find out? Let's see. Let's ask him and see how he reacts. If he jumps out of his chair and starts screaming about not being gay, there's some. There's a little bit of a, you know, there's some not maybe not tension, but some animosity. Some some maybe you're going to look at him and think, okay, maybe this guy does have an issue with with people who have alternative lifestyles. Because um, really, and that's my thing. It's like you say, what's the logic there? And that's like, and I I have no idea if I'm right, but and I say this all the time with Joe. Sometimes I'll say I'll say stuff and Joe's like, oh, you're making excuses for somebody. No, I'm I'm literally using my mind to try to like the best explanation I can come up with as to why somebody would do that, because it's not there's not a good answer, there's not a good reason. Um, well, I shouldn't even say not a good reason. It, it it is a bizarre question. So the only good reason I can come up with is is this team worried that this guy's got a short fuse, um, and they want to see how he responds. And again, it it could be it could just be they want to create it may not be guys it, this might be a team that asked every one of their prospects and guys is the only one that came out and said it because some of these guys know like hey i keep a low profile keep my mouth shut i don't want to get drafted i don't want to rock the boat um i don't want to come off of anybody's draft board type of thing so guys is the only one that said it we don't know if he was the only one that was asked but the, what i heard after the des bryant thing is that sometimes these executives like to see you know let, let's say something i mean, would they ask des bryant if his mom was a prostitute i mean that's about that that's beyond ridiculous that's way yeah. where that's I don't know what the hell was going on there, but uh, it, and that's what it is. If they get if, maybe they hear news that a guy's got a temper or a short fuse, and if you rub him the wrong way, he'll flip out, and they put that to the test. Because guess what? 
you're going to be in an NFL stadium where where opposing fans are going to scream racial and bigoted epithets at you. They're going to call you every name in the book. They're going to call you gay. They're going to do this and that, and they want to see how you respond. That, again, I could be 100% wrong. Totally possible. The guy that asked him was just an asshole. I don't know. But in terms of trying to put it in terms that, you know, that makes some sense, it's like, all right, this is a guy who's going to be a big part of your franchise's future. Good chance he's going to be your feature running back. You want to kind of poke and prod and see if you can find out if there's something there that you may not want in your locker room. I think those are some good theories. I really do. I mean, try to get, like, and now, someone off, off kilter, you know, by asking them something like that. I mean, I don't think I could have said any better myself. It's It's weird. And I personally don't care whether or not, you know, he likes men or not myself, but, you know, you don't want him having that open animosity towards others where, you know, he might, you know, say some things and you don't, you don't, you don't want like a cancerous type of guy in your, in your locker room. Yeah, because, so. because really, if you look at it this way, put yourself in the shoes of that GM or that scout or that executive and, let, and not Darius guys, anybody, let's say any player has an incident, be it someone racial, let, let's say domestic violence. Let's say there's a domestic violence incident and uh, a guy beats up a girl and then it comes out later that he had a history of it in college and you knew about it. Did you ask him about it? Did you, did you address it? Why, why were you comfortable drafting or signing that guy knowing his history? Did you even grill him on it? Well, no, we thought that was a personal subject, so we thought we didn't want to tread there. Well, what are you doing? Are you doing your job? Are you doing your due diligence and doing a, a real background and, and finding out what makes this guy tick? So, I mean, this, these, these guys are multi-million dollar investments. You know, you're not, you're not hiring this guy to flip burgers on the grill. You know what I mean? These are multi-million dollar investments that one wrong move, you know, nobody wants a, a, a domestic violence or a, any type of hate speech or any, you know, anything offensive, which, I mean, let's face it, everything is offensive nowadays, but I think you oh, know yeah. what I'm saying. And, um, and to that and point, Glenn, it, like, it's, it's, sorry, go ahead, I'm cutting off. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, you know, to that point, it's, and this is circling back to something you said earlier, it's not crazy to think that there could have been some rumor about him having some type of animosity towards gay people or whatever. Like, you know, think about it, like, you know, Daniel Jeremiah, you know, if you listen to the Moves of Six podcast, and he talks about his scouting days and being on the road. He said, you know, I like to view myself as Magnum P.I. Like, I was like a private investigator. That was, mm-hmm. you know, more so than gathering, you know, measurables and stuff on people. It was all about, like, getting stories about into their, their personal, their background life, how they are on campus and things like that. And listen, you just said, and this is exactly what I was thinking when you were saying it, you know, uh, we're ultra sensitive nowadays. Everything is, you know, is hate speech and everything you're saying is, you know, offends me. And, you know, I want you to call me by this and don't call me that. Yeah, if, like, if, 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 where the, if where you the disagree with me, it's, it's equivalent. It's, it's equivalent to violence and hate speech because we disagree. God, yeah. What the hell is happening to the First Amendment in this country? But anyway, you know, I mean, guys, he could have said some little fleeting comment about like, you know, Oh, uh, you're a fag or something like that to one of his homeboys, really not meaning that much behind it, really not meaning like, oh, I hate gay people or whatever. I feel uncomfortable around gay people. And there could have mm-hmm. been somebody in the classroom, you know, maybe a homosexual, maybe not, some type of social justice mm-hmm. warrior person. I was who just going to the word right out of my mouth. Brought, maybe a social justice brought warrior. It, brought it to administration. And then Geist is getting mm-hmm. brought in, they're like, what are you doing, man? And then all of a sudden, the, you know, the private investigator, the, the NFL scout, that is, comes in, and he gets wind of this incident. Like, it's not crazy to think something like that could have happened, even though Geist meant nothing behind it. So, bring him to the exactly. combine, let's ask and him about it, and let's see how he reacts. Exactly. And, and like I said, I, I have, I'm, not, I'm not claiming to know that is what happened, but, you know, like I said, I, I put myself in the shoes of, of people, when people say, why did this guy do that? I try to come up with the best reason in my mind, right or wrong, justified, unjustified, agree, disagree, the best reason my brain can come up with, and that's what I got on that. It's a test for him where they heard something they didn't like. Um, but uh, one guy that uh, I, I looked earlier, I think it was NFL.com, I was looking at a few different mock drafts, 
And uh, one guy that I saw mock to the Jets, and I thought, oh, perfect, because this is something I'm going to talk about tonight on the podcast. I want to touch, on, touch base with, it, uh, with Kyle on this, because it is a possibility. Um, first of all, how would you feel about the pick? And second of all, how do you feel about all the rhetoric right now? Um, if the Jets go with Lamar Jackson at number six, and first of all, how would you feel about that at six? Like I said, I'm pretty sure it was NFL.com. You know, the problem is they put out, you know, a new mock draft every other day by 25 different people. Um, but I, <clears throat> I think PFF too. Somebody else had a mock to the Jets. But anyway, I think the, uh, I think 99% of people out there view him as a quarterback. I view him as a quarterback. As I said to Joe, I don't know. Do I want him? I don't know because I worry about the lower body and the tendency to run in the NFL. Um, but do I want to play against him? Hell no. Like, I don't want my defense to have to game plan for that guy. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't hate the pick. But what are your thoughts on the Jets potentially taking him? Is that too high for him? And what do you think about all that's being said? I, I feel like – I'll put my, my feelings out there first. You can comment. That, uh, you know, one or two people, maybe three people, said that they think this guy is a receiver based on his skill set. Um, and now I'm seeing all over my Twitter timeline that why does everybody say this guy is a receiver? Why is it, why does everyone say? And I'm like everyone. I, I saw I think Gil Brand said it, and th- that's really the only one I saw. I saw who Pol- said it. I think Polian um, said on that too. So Polian too. Maybe. Okay. It, okay. And then the other thing was, um, and, and again, putting myself in the the shoes of the executives. If you're if you're the Philadelphia Eagles, if you're the Indianapolis Colts, if you're a team that you've got your quarterback, you know that you have your quarterback in the future for the next five, ten years, and you're looking at this draft class and you're watching film on Lamar Jackson and you look at him and go, this guy could be better than any other receiver in this draft. Are you not doing your job if you don't ask him that question? Like, if you're like, listen, dude, we got Carson Wentz, so we're good. But we like you better than any of the receivers in this draft. Would you consider that? Is there anything wrong with that? Because, again, just like the last scenario with, with doing background checks, aren't you not doing your job if you don't do something like that? I mean, he's a special athlete. So you, you look at him with the ball in his hands versus most running backs in college, and he's better than them. It, the thing that's crazier to me is, What's all this wide receiver talk with? Do we see him catching balls on Saturday? No, we see him running with the rock, and he does a damn good job at it. And it's not just he's fast. No, he sets up defenders. You know, he, oh, I can't remember which game yeah, it was. he's explosive. But when, like, when he hits that top gear, he's gone. Oh, yeah, it's, it's special. You know, um, he's, you know, probably not top, you know, like in terms of his top speed as fast as Michael Vick. But he's definitely a smarter runner than Vic. There's no question about that. I think he sets up defenders better. I think he knows when to slide better. So I, the, the crazier thing to me is why aren't teams asking him if he'd play running back? Because I think he'd be a better running back. I know he's very slight, and he's 6'3". You don't see 6'3 running backs that are that That, that was going to be my answer. 6'2", 6'3", and that frame, you, you don't see that very often. That, that's the only thing I could think of. And, and I think that's why you know, the the point you made why why wide receiver, well I think that's why they want to see him play wide receiver. Like we've seen what he can do with the ball in his hands. Let's see if he can catch it. Um, and again I I applaud what he did. I have I have no issue with him saying I'm a quarterback, because let's face it that's the position he plays. That's where the money is, and he's done it well enough that he should play it in the NFL. I'm not saying any of that isn't true. I'm saying from the perspective of a GM. If you're looking at that guy and saying, oh, my God, that dude is electric, but I don't need a quarterback, but I could put him somewhere where my quarterback could get him the ball. Um, yeah, I mean, and listen, I just feel Heinz like as a GM, you're not Heinz doing your Ward job if you don't do that. Heinz Ward quarterback. I'm sorry, Julian say that again. Edelman quarter, Heinz Ward was a quarterback in college. He went on to have a very good career in the NFL, <laughs> well over 1,000 receptions. Julian Edelman. Wouldn't be shocked if he finishes, you know, somewhere close to a thousand receptions by the end of his career. Um, you know, there have been several Antoine Randallels, several quarterbacks that have made successful transitions. Um, and and some of the guys aren't as and that, that, that's, 
that that's one of the things I look at because I you know I, I keep hear you know not keep hearing but I've heard a few people say is anybody asking Josh Allen to work at tight end and I think you know what I if not for Josh McDaniel like Tim Tebow might have never played quarterback in the NFL because I remember going into that draft all the experts McShay Kuyper um, at least to the best of my memory a lot of them were saying like this guy's best shot is at fullback or H back. Like, he is not a quarterback, and a lot of people felt that way. It took one guy, Josh McDaniels, to come in the first round. But Matt Jones, remember Matt Jones? The, what was he, Arkansas, I believe he played quarterback? He was six Yeah, he six, was like a four. And he four, ran a crazy three, 40. 40. And teams looked at him, and they were like, yo, this dude's a wide receiver. Not because of his skin color, but because of his, his skill set and his physique. Um, Scott Frost, granted, he was a scrubby option quarterback, but teams looked at him and said, we can make him a DB. Let's, let's move him to safety. Bill Parcells drafts and makes him a safety. These guys get paid to evaluate. But so, and look, sometimes they're right, sometimes they're wrong. But I don't think they're moving guys around the field based on their skin. I don't think J.T. Barrett got asked to work at wide receiver because he doesn't look like a guy who can play wide receiver. Matt Jones did look like a guy who could play wide receiver, so he did. Tim Tebow was a guy that, you know, like Lamar Jackson, refused to work anywhere else. But we heard it said a million times, teams wanted him to work at fullback and tight end. Um, you know, so, yeah, Jones, Frost, you mentioned Edelman. Edelman was a college quarterback. Now, of course, none of these guys were on the level of Lamar Jackson. I mean, you could argue Tebow was, national championship, Heisman Trophy, all that. But you still just watch them play football, and Jackson's a far better player. Um, and he's going to play quarterback, and I think he's going to play quarterback. And, I, I, you know, again, my concern lies with how much he takes off and how small his frame is. If he can add some bulk and, you know, beef up a little bit, I'd have no issue with that pick at all. But um, yeah, I, 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 I think it's weird your, that I keep your, seeing people question. saying – oh, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, uh, I want to answer your first question. Uh, do I mind taking them six overall? Uh, honestly, I think I'd, I, I wouldn't – I mean, I want other quarterbacks there before him. But if, mm-hmm. it's, if it's him at six versus – I mean, like Denzel Ward, like I, I was, I'm pretty like impressed by his numbers at the combine and how good he was this year. And he's a slot guy, and I think there's a lot of value in that. Versus him, or you know, somebody like God, I don't. I, there's not even too many guys at six outside. Like you know, Chubb's probably going to go before six. I don't want mm-hmm. Saquon Barkley. If you're telling me right now, I could draft Saquon Barkley at six or Lamar Jackson. I think I'd probably want Lamar. And I say that because. I think the Jets are already pretty good at running back. And what is the difference between Saquon Barkley and Sony Michelle versus Nick Chubb versus you know some of these other guys? You know, Carry on Johnson. I don't think That's Barkley, the guy I like. Who? Carry on Johnson. I haven't watched him yet, but this is a loaded yeah, carry, running back class. Is what I'm saying. Carry exactly. Yeah, Carry on Johnson out of Auburn. I think is currently. I looked at Matt Miller's newest seven-round mock. He's got him going 52. So he would still be on the board at 49 when the Jets pick. Um, I like him better than Chubb. Um, I like Jones out of USC, but I think he'll be gone um, before the second round hits. I think he's a potential first-round back. But if you get a chance to watch some carry on Johnson, take a look at him. I will do that. But, uh, you know, going back to Jackson, I mean, they put up the velocity numbers today, and he clocked in at 49, which is disappointing. Um, but I think that Watson kind of showed us, you know, 49 miles an hour. That, didn't, that wasn't too much of a problem for him last year. And even Tyrod no, Taylor, he, he, was, he was 50 miles an hour. And I know I, I've, I've said a lot about the whole velocity thing in, in, in previous years. I was surprised that Jackson threw that look. Because if you watch it, you know, you watch him, it doesn't – he definitely puts enough juice on that ball. And he can push the ball downfield. And another thing is the dude goes through progression. You know, they yep. asked him at the combine, like, why did you choose Louisville? He said it's a pro-style system. And, yep, you know, there's a, lot of tr- there's a lot of truth to that. Also, like, you look at, like, you know, he is a little inaccurate from time to time, but what is the problem with his inaccuracy? Usually it's like when, you know, he's clicking from one read to another and he's got that really narrow base. And he knows he needs mm-hmm. to correct that. Now, that is much more correctable than something like upper body. You know, it's easier to fix right. footwork than it is to fix a throwing motion. And his throwing motion is, is clean. It's compact versus, you know, someone and like he just, John he just Allen. And he just flicks the ball. The ball just flies out of his hand. 
Yeah, and it gets downfield, and he hits people in stride. And you know, you want to make, people want to make the excuse for Rosen not having weapons and for Allen not having weapons. Well, neither did Jackson. I think that also factored into his completion percentage being what it was. So, I, taking Jackson at six, I'd be pretty happy with. I, I like Lamar Jackson. I think, and he's also he's very good off the field. You know, he he does some charity work and stuff. I think he's a very mature person. I think he handled those questions very well. Um, I was just going to say he was pretty gonna, funny at the combine. I enjoyed that. Yeah, of course. You're going to have to switch up your offense a lot. But the thing is, like, you you bring him in year one, you're going to – you're not going to be running a traditional NFL offense. You're going to be running a lot of college stuff. But is that really a problem? I mean, look at the Eagles this year. They went on and won a Super Bowl running a lot of college stuff. I mean – you have to, you're going to have to be one of those teams that's going to have to pick up things from the college game. You have the guy who has that skill set that can run those things, adapt your offense accordingly. There was a really good piece that I read in the ringer um, from a couple months ago. I think it was like around the time of the Super Bowl, maybe a couple weeks before that or whatever. And they interviewed Andy Reid, and he was saying typically the pro game is five years behind uh, what the college game is in terms of it takes them, you know, the college starts doing, you know, certain types of concepts, formations, whatever. And then the pro game, you know, it usually takes about five years to catch up and start doing those things as well. Well, if you draft Lamar Jackson, you might have to flip that curve a little bit, be a couple years ahead of the curve, start incorporating some of that stuff now. And, and Bill O'Brien, kudos to him. He adjusted his offense to Deshaun Watson's skill set and look at how good that offense was when he was in there versus when Tom Savage and, whoever the hell else was playing quarterback for that. So you'll have to switch up your offense. Saying, but, in there. Yeah. But, I mean, you factor in his running ability, too. And when I came on Jet Nation Radio last year, I was talking – I was very pro signing Tyrod Taylor. It's going to make your running game better. And every year that um, Buffalo has had Tyrod Taylor, they've been tops of the league in terms of rushing attack. Immediately this Jets rushing attack is going to get better. And because your rushing attack gets better, you can start doing all those RPOs. You know, God, we watched the Super Bowl this year, and RPO every five seconds. I don't know what the Vegas odds were for how many times will they say RPO in the Super Bowl. They were yeah, exactly. Were RPOs that, that weren't RPOs. But the thing is, is yep. that's going to be more of a thing in the NFL nowadays. And if you have Jackson, who is a legit threat to run on any given play, that mm-hmm. can open up passing lanes for him. That's going to make that's yeah. going to, it's going to simplify the offense for him. So, to to say that this guy can't play in the NFL, no, that's ridiculous. He can play in the NFL. As yeah, I mean, he he's, to, he's going to be even if even if he never you know becomes a great quarterback, he, he there's no reason to believe he won't be as good or better than a lot of guys who are quarterbacks in the league right now. Yeah, uh, for sure. And I think it was Daniel sure. Jeremiah who you mentioned earlier who said that. Uh, he said he thinks that he's going to have the single biggest day one impact for any rookie. Like, whoever drafts him is going to have a guy that can, you know, change games immediately. Um, now, you know, what, how he develops from there yet is, remains to be seen. But, um, yeah, that was just that, that was something I thought I'd run by you because I saw it a lot. I told someone earlier, I saw it on uh, former Jets running back Thomas Jones. He had that on his timeline, you know, um, a similar type of comment. Why, you know, how come he's being asked to work at wide receiver and nobody else is? And then I, I was sure I saw it from Lamar Jackson, so I Googled it. Jackson said the day before that nobody asked him to run receiver routes at the Combine. But people were, like, just taking the story and running with it and just talking about what a, what a this travesty, a miscarriage of justice. And the player himself was like, no, I don't know where that came from. Nobody asked me to run receiver drills. But it didn't stop, you know, the Internet from just I, – I did see somewhere that one team during a, a, when he met with all the teams or when all the teams met, they asked if he would be – working at receiver or something like that. But basically, if I were to look at my Twitter feed, I would have thought 26 teams asked him to work at wide receiver. Um, and, you know, he, he himself came out and said nobody asked him to. So, uh, But I, I think he is a quarterback. I think he'll be a good one. Um, the injury risk worries me, but I would have a hard time being upset if the Jets didn't up, did end up grabbing him. You know, a uh, great option, game changer, who's currently projected as a second rounder, but, uh, you know, by some by some experts and – other people are kind of saying he's a he's a first round guy for sure. So two guys who could be on the Jets radar. Uh, you know, didn't mean to go on that long, but I, I think they're interesting topics with uh, Darius Geis, Lamar Jackson, a little bit of controversy, and um, and let's face it, free agency is still a week away. We've talked about Kirk Cousins um, and the, and the flexibility that gives them. 
I can't remember if I said it uh, earlier this show or when we tried the the previous one, but my big thing is I would love to get Kirk Cousins to trade down and let's fill a few more needs. Um, it, it, yeah. Let's say hypothetically, let's say that happens. Where are the Bills picking? Are they 21-22? I, I believe you're right, 21-22. Yeah, so we, we don't see a lot of you know trades within the division very often. But let's say hypothetically you're the Jets, you sign Kirk Cousins, the Bills call you up and say, we'll give you 21, 22, our number one next year, blah, 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 blah. They give you enough picks to make you make the deal. Now you're, oh, da- now you're down back end of round two. You can grab back-to-back players. What, what, what type of players are you looking at in that range, Kyle? Uh, shoot. In that range, like I said, I'm very still, and I know it's, <laughs> we're only 50 days away from the draft, and I still have to do a lot of work. But in terms of positions, I'm, I'm looking at corners and stuff. Uh, I'm looking at uh, potential guys who who can pass rush. We talked about Arden Key, and, you know, he had a very disappointing uh, day at the Combine, you know. So I don't know if I'd even be looking at him anymore. But um, 21 and 22. Have have you you ever watched Harold Landry at all out of Boston College? I haven't watched him yet, but I went through and I looked at his numbers, and he's got elite movement skills for a a Mm -hmm. guy, uh, for a pass rusher. His three cone was really good. His jumps were good. Yep. His 40 was good. All those things matter for a pass rusher. And you talk about get off and explosion, and he's got the mm-hmm. tape to back it up. And he's got multiple years. He's not a, a one year wonder Kevin Dodd type of player. So, you right. know, people who I trust and respect their opinions, like John Ledyard, who, you know, he, he charts pass rushers, edge rushers specifically on an NFL basis. And he's a, obviously a draft guy. He's very high on on Landry, and he's basically saying that Landry should not get past the Green Bay Packers at, like, pick 15, 16 or whatever. So um, as much as we might like that, I really doubt that he would be there at 21 or 22. But that doesn't mean that you can't trade back to 21, 22, and then, oh, well, we got some picks. Let's move up a couple spots now to go and get our edge rusher. That 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 was the original range I thought was, uh, was, I think, Arizona sitting at 15. I remember thinking – if the Jets sign Cousins, do you move down to 15 because Arizona wants a quarterback and that'd be a, a spot to get Landry. And, and, and that's the funny thing, and, and I say it to Joe every year, and I'm, I'm guilty of it too, not, not quite as bad as some, some uh, analysts, but I, I feel like if I took the time, like let's say I start the day after the draft this year if I really cared enough to do it. If you wrote down every, the name of every player, who one of the, whether it's Matt Miller or Daniel Jeremiah or Bucky Brooks, write down the name of every player that they tell you can sneak into the first round, you'd probably have about 250 guys that could sneak into the top yeah. 32. Um, and, you know, every year, look, somebody falls. And this year, I know uh, Eric Galco from Optimum Scouting, who I really like. I think we're, uh, we're working with him to get him on the show here pretty soon. Um, he said, and I've heard him say it a couple times, he thinks we're going to see eight offensive linemen go in the first round. And that's a big number. Um, when you're talking yeah, it is. eight O-linemen, and probably five, maybe six quarterbacks. Well, probably not six, but not unrealistic to say five quarterbacks. That's, that's half the first round right there on linemen and quarterbacks. Um, of course, pass rushers are prime positions too, so a guy like Landry might be in there. But, uh, but that remains to be seen. Like you said, the draft now I think is 49, 50 days away. Free agency. I think it's 49. Course, before yeah. that, next week. Yeah, free agency. Uh, what do we got? About four days till teams can talk. Two days till they can sign. The Jets right now, last number I saw was 92 million in cap space. Look, put this. They have a lot, and that that's going to bring me to my last question, Kyle, because um, I've seen this in a couple different places, and I, I I scratch my head. I really can't figure out what people are saying here. Um, I saw I saw it mentioned with the corner position. Uh, we talked about Kyle Fuller earlier. But I've seen I've seen people say that the Jets wanted were, were very much interested in Weston Richburg, but they've already taken themselves out of that because the price tag is getting too high because uh, eight or nine teams are interested. And then I've heard that they're going to go for they're not going to go for any of the upper tier corners. They're going to go for the Bashad Breelands, the 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 mid lower tier guys. It, that can't be true, can it? Like you don't you don't put yourself in a position to have ninety million dollars to spend. And then pinch your pennies and say, well, we're not, we're not getting any top guys. We're not going to, you know, we, our biggest need behind quarterback might be center, but we're going to go out and get Swanson from Detroit, who, again, I'm not going to pretend I've seen a ton of the guy, 
But when I saw his name mentioned, I watched a couple of games on the All-22. Kind of reminded me an awful lot of Wesley Johnson. I just saw a guy getting pushed around and ragdolled an awful lot. And I just thought, why is, it, why is this guy even being considered? Um, and I've, I've looked up, you know, sites and analysts that say he's a talented guy. On film, the couple games I watched, I didn't see it. I just saw a guy getting beat up a lot and a quarterback running for his life. But do you think there's any chance the Jets are going to enter free agency with $90 million and then shop in the bargain bin? Um, no. And I think a big part of that is they're going to give possibly the biggest contract by far in NFL history to Kirk Cousins. You know, so they're not trying to shop in the bargain bin, but I think they're also trying to be realistic. You can't go out and how many teams go out, and even if they sign one really, really big free agent, top guy at their position, they usually don't do that with two, three, four different positions. So you have to be realistic. I mean, if the Jets, if the Jets are going to go in and sign Cousins, you're not going to also be able to sign a couple of the top-tier free agents. And, you know, I mean, here's another thing, too. Like, we're hearing these rumors and stuff. I don't think that there's really anyone who has a really good pulse on this Jets front office yet. It's not like it was under Tannenbaum. You know, I mean, one thing that McCagney, I would say, is pretty good at is, you know, keeping things under lock and really, like, being a little bit unpredictable from time to time. You know, one thing that was really refreshing, you know, during his first couple of years was, you know, we would get word of this guy was visiting the Jets during the free agency period after he left. You know, versus in previous right. years, you would know of a guy who was visiting before he visited there. You know, so these reports could be totally and, and you false. And you look at the, how the Mo Wilk thing unfolded. You make a good point. You know, we saw up until a few hours before that deal was announced, like the top guys, I think yeah. it was Rappaport, was like, oh, no deal is imminent between Mo yeah. Wilk and the Jets, probably going to get that. And then an hour later, oh, the deal is done. So, and, and I that, had and seen that, more, and, and, that was, and it was announced after the deadline was passed, like a solid yep. hour, half hour, whatever that was away. Like, you know, we thought, oh, well, he's playing under the tag. So, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, this front office has been tight-lipped. I mean, yeah, obviously not going to pinch pennies at the quarterback position, but uh, I thought, like, my, my big thing and, – and the thing the thing with Richburg that worries me is the concussions. I don't know how I feel about yeah. going out and signing a guy who just missed 12 games due to concussions. That's a lot of time to miss. Um and you go out and sign him, give him eight nine million dollars, and then he gets another couple concussions, and then he's out for the year. Um, that's a that's a risky uh, proposition right there. And that's the only reason I could think why the Giants wouldn't want to resign him. You don't let a, a guy you drafted yourself with an early draft pick, second third rounder, you know, and when your offensive line is that bad, he's one of the few bright spots on that offensive line. You're just going to let him walk. I mean, they must really be thinking, man, his head is pretty messed up. So. That is yeah, concerning yeah. for sure. Yeah, absolutely. So we'll see what happens there. Like I said, four days teams talk, six days deals start becoming official. Uh, thanks again, Kyle, for joining me tonight. Um, hopefully for those uh, those missing out on Joe, hopefully we get a, a weekend episode done sometime soon. And like I said, we're working on some guests, uh, or we're working on getting Eric Galco on with us next week. Uh, hopefully that happens because he is one of the best in the business, doesn't get nearly enough credit, and uh, and the, he, Optum Scouting, will be putting out again their annual draft guide. I believe it's their 10th one. And uh, I first became aware of them last year, and I got that draft guide, and that thing was awesome. So highly recommended. Um, it'll, be, it'll be, I believe he said they're still working on it. He said it'll be out sometime after the combine. More to come on that and more to come next week. Kyle, thanks a lot for joining us. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much, sir. Appreciate it. I had a good time. All right. Same here, man. Have a great night, and uh, we'll talk to you next time. Take care, everybody. Take care, Glenn. Bye. Take care.